So many of you may know Ryan as the lead editor of News Gathering for Guardian Media Limited. He's covered a range of topics, including politics, sports, and climate change. His work in climate change started in 2021 during COP26, and he has attended COP27 in Egypt and COP28 in Dubai. So Ryan, from the perspective of media, what are some of the key messages that are very pressing for the Caribbean? And how can we leverage the media to advance climate action ahead of COP29? All right, thanks very much for having me, Deval, and good evening to everyone. Um, I think a lot of what was discussed in the first session ties back into what the media should be talking about midway to COP29. Um, top of our tongues would be climate finance. Uh, the media itself has a huge role to push that particular agenda. I often see comments about, um, you know, <clears throat> this is small island states, not just here in the Caribbean, but in the Pacific as well. Um, you know, you always see these commentaries about these small island states wanting money from developed nations. Why don't you go find the cash yourself? We can't, all right? We don't have the capacity. We are not that developed and we're being adversely affected. So I think the messaging that you use a very keyword, the messaging from the media, midway point from now on headed to Baku has to center around things like climate finance, loss and damage fund, with which uh, Sasha explained so brilliantly. Uh, those things are key for us. Uh, and that's one of the things that I try to, when I speak about climate journalism, that's one of the things that I try to get across to, to people who are covering. The climate change world is so highly technical and it's so large, right, that you could get lost in it. It has to always encompass uh, what is key for us here in the Caribbean. What do we want to get? You know, we don't have coal to study about. Coal doesn't matter to us. That's an India problem. That's a Europe problem, right? Um, but, you know, the loss and damage fund, uh, because we're having such severe impacts uh, on, us, on us small island states here in the Caribbean, loss and damage fund, that's very important to us. So we need to get our messaging right when it comes to the loss and damage fund. Access to climate finance. Is the World Bank, you know, uh, trustworthy enough for small island states like us to go to, you know? That's the conversations that we should be having as journalists, climate journalists, and as a media fraternity midway point to COP and headed to Baku over the next few months. I hope that made sense. It does. Thank you, Ryan. And in addition to what you mentioned, what comes to mind in terms of the role of media is also holding our leaders accountable. And how has how have you seen the media play that role and have you experienced any challenges in terms of holding our leaders, local, regional, even international, accountable to these urgently needed climate commitments? So I want to answer that question uh, with two sides to the very same coin. One of it, yes, it's holding politicians and leaders and negotiators who go to these climate conferences and make pledges. Yes, it's absolutely holding them to account. And there are a lot of challenges, particularly here in an oil and gas based country like Trinidad and Tobago, where you hear the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries talk about energy transition, but you never really see movement towards that energy transition. So yes, uh, there are really big challenges when it comes to uh, having a just transition, a draft just transition policy for so many years, but you could never really see it over the line. We, we need to keep asking those questions. What I do want to also add though, which I think is often forgotten, it's not just a politician's thing. It's not just a government thing. It's not just holding a government uh, to account wherever you go. And when you go globally, uh, it, it sometimes the challenges could get much bigger when you talk about the lobbying industry, the oil and gas industry, because sometimes you may be right here in Trinidad and Tobago, you may be lucky as a journalist that the government doesn't take you on if you ask hard questions. But BP might. Shell might. And it's not only that they take you on, what they try to do is they take you down. 
So they send you a pre-action protocol letter, right, to stifle you or to gag you. And out of that pre-action protocol letter, they hope that you and your company don't have enough money to fight back, and so you stop publishing. So it's, it's a little bit more than just government. It's a little bit more than just politics. In fact, I would venture to say it's a lot more because when you have these huge oil and gas industries, Exxon in Guyana, they really have not only the might, but they have the finances to try to shut you down. Thanks for giving us that broad view of, you know, the challenges that you face. Um, but we definitely commend you and encourage you to continue the work that you're doing in the media. And just before we bring Riyadh into the conversation, I want to ask you, I think you're almost a, a cop veteran by now. Um, what are your expectations realistically for COP29? I, so here's why I would like to answer your question, but I might not by the end of this statement. Uh, and I hope that you're not upset with this answer. <laughs> um, so I, what I want to, and this is, this is particularly me speaking to broadly to the audience here. As a journalist, I think it's important that everybody in the room understands or come to understand by the end of this statement that there is a difference between a climate journalist and a climate activist. Um, I don't try to be the latter, because I'm not. Um, not that I'm saying that I'll never be. Not that I'm saying that I deny climate change. Not that I'm saying that I don't believe that the climate is changing. But I'm a climate journalist. And covering climate journalism uh, means that I give BP a voice, but also Ruana a voice. Uh, and there's a clear line of demarcation of being balanced. The Loss and Damage Fund was a, on the opening morning of the COP28 in Dubai. Um, even as a climate journalist, that was almost like a World Cup moment. Um, to, to see that something that uh, people even before you were born kind of were championing and hoping for, talking to Prime Minister Gaston Brown at COP27, and he was so passionate about it. And then over the next few months, covering climate change, talking to Ruana before, since four, and you realize, you know, we had this crowning moment in COP, in Dubai at COP28, and then it sort of just went cold. I'm hoping, uh, really hoping that the fund, the, the tools of the fund, all of the intricacies and the details at COP29 from a Caribbean standpoint, I'm really hoping that we could get somewhere with it. Uh, I know it's a finance COP, I'm really hoping that there is some news that can come out of COP29 uh, in Azerbaijan that small island states that are really facing the brunt of the climate uh, change can have some good news to go into the next year with, particularly with climate finance and loss and damage. Yes, I think we're all hoping for stronger action as we head to COP29. So I'm very excited to welcome Mr. Riyad Mohammed, Environmental Education Officer attached to the Public Education Unit at the Environmental Management Authority. Um, Riyad works closely with the Action for Climate Empowerment, ACE, focal points to fulfill Trinidad and Tobago's obligation under the UNFCCC, ACE, Glasgow Work Program. So Riyad, Youth are important stakeholders in climate action, and youth have been very vocal in demanding stronger action. And they continue to bring creative and innovative approaches to climate advocacy and activism and action on a whole. So what are your thoughts on the state of global climate change development, and how can we really build momentum and accelerate action for the Caribbean? Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, I agree. Youth is, if not the most important stakeholder, definitely up there. And as a youth, sometimes I feel like we are highly tokenized. You know, um, it's important that we attend these things so that they could tick um, a checkbox. 
And that's unfortunate because I think now that we have a, a much higher proportion of youth that are so brave and so willing to speak out and stand up. And that's something that we really need to take advantage of in the best way possible. Um, we speak about futures. We, we speak about what could happen in 2050, 2060, 2070, 2100. And what we fail to realize is that this current generation of youth and the future generations are the ones that are, that are going to be smacked dead in the middle of this climate or triple planetary crisis. And this is why they need to be given a voice. Um, I'll just speak briefly about my experience at the SITS conference, which was, by the way, my first international conference. Um, it was interesting because after the third side event, I realized very quickly that it's just all about talk. And I heard the same thing for about an hour back to back. And as a youth and as somebody that really wants to see change, that's not very hopeful. Because then I think to myself, if we do everything perfectly in Trinidad and Tobago, if we, 100%, if we have 100% renewable energy, if we have all the environmentally sustainable behaviors embedded in our um, culture and our society, we're still gonna be affected by climate change, right? So it's a little disheartening, but sometimes you just have to keep going. And I mean, I, I looked at Sasha's expression and I was like, oh, okay, she has, a, she has a positive look on her face, so maybe there's something we could look forward to. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I really feel like, you know, as one island, if you stand up, it's noble, it's brave, but together it's powerful if we come together. And I think that there's a need for joint advocacy across the islands. I remember meeting other environmental educators and I felt this spark. I was like, oh, okay, I could just keep going. We could just keep doing things, make the projects that we are doing locally, um, something regional and then maybe something international. And well, I come from that education background, that edu education standpoint. And I believe that education needs to be, especially climate education needs to be woven into that fabric of education because it doesn't only affect scientists, it doesn't only affect the, the um, negotiators, it's affecting everybody. So when we do things like maths, instead of looking at how many fruits you have in a market stall, why don't we look at how many trees are being cut down? Why don't we bring in the terms like deforestation and climate change into these things? So people are already sensitized to it at a very early age. Um, one thing I could also say is that we, in our pursuit to educate Trinidad and Tobago, there's a need, a very, very drastic need for behavioral or cultural change. Um, and one that, well, our current culture is influenced by one, our dependence on oil and gas. So when we go to companies and we speak to the older folks, um, they tend to just, they listen to us and they're like, okay, well, yeah. When we speak to youth, when I was 12, 13, 14, I knew nothing about climate change. I just knew that, oh, okay, um, the globe getting hotter. Now they are able to tell us about climate change. So clearly something is happening, but the education needs to be more consistent and needs to be there and it needs to keep happening. So I'll, I'll just speak about one program that we are really proud to implement, um, well, proud to be implementing because it's gonna be launched next year. And I think that this is something that every country should implement. And the name of it is the Youth Climate Ambassadors Program. And it takes the form of a one week intensive climate training workshop. So what it aims to do is we're gonna invite persons between the ages of 15 to 35 to um, apply, apply to be a part of this program. And when they apply, we're gonna do one week in Trinidad, one week in Tobago, and we're gonna explore climate change topics across the board. We're gonna look at climate justice, climate finance, climate adaptation, mitigation. And the aim of this is to really get people thinking from a young, at, at a younger age. You know, if I had these opportunities, I think I would be in a much better place now, right? I'd be, I'd be doing much greater things. Um, I'd be more aware. And I just want to leave you all with this, you know, education is so important. For us to know what we have to do in just transition, for us to know what we have to do in mitigation, adaptation, for us to understand loss and damage, we need to have that education. And um, yeah, when done right, when done just, um, it's the most powerful tool. And yeah, I just, I really look forward to seeing positive change. Um, and it's cliche, but it's all we could hope for. 
as a small island developing state, um, looking at mitigation is, is, I mean, we're beyond that. We have to start looking at adaptation. We have to start looking at how to prevent these things because, I mean, it's already here. There's no more climate changes knocking on the door. Climate change is in the room. It's here with us. So I just really hope to see um, the support for SIDS, but also support amongst SIDS, because together we are very powerful. Indeed, and definitely education is an important aspect of adaptation and resilience. Um, you mentioned tokenism, youth tokenism, which is something that we have been trying to get away from. Um, any thoughts on how we can better support and equip youth to engage in youth-led climate action? Yeah, um, oh gosh, and I, I don't think that I feel like I'm a token in this event, right? Because I'm, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I definitely don't feel like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, no, just just giving them an opportunity to, I mean, for these negotiations, some of these things are so technical, uh, they don't even know where to begin negotiating. But even just having them as observers, having them be a part um, of these meetings, just to see how it is and to understand um, mentorship programs. I mean, climate analytics, I look up to you all so much. When I grow up, I want to be like you all. Um, you know, giving them the opportunity to understand these things, I think is, is very important. And like that Youth Climate Ambassadors program, I think it would equip them in the best way possible. You know, they're going to go into university already understanding a lot of these concepts, and that could also help them pursue things that could put them into the right places, the right rooms to, to really effectuate greater action. Thank you. And coming back to you, Ryan, I think we are known for operating in silos, but for us to really have a chance at addressing climate change, we need it to be integrated into all sectors. So again, from the media perspective, have you been seeing the integration of climate considerations and other form uh, forms of journalism? So um, I think we are doing a lot better than we used to. Um, I think now, let me, let me take it from a macro standpoint down to a micro, right? Um, so sort of covering it over the last few years, certainly a body like, let's just take a body like CARICOM. CARICOM now speaks as one voice at these conferences. I, 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 I can't say that I, I used to cover it 10 years ago, but I've been told that it was much more individual back then. Let's just say something like, I don't know, Paris Agreement or before that, right? Um, I, it used to be individual islands almost speaking individually. From what I understand and what I've seen over the last few years is that they actually come in caucus before COPs or before these major climate conferences they have a common theme, they have a common messaging, and everybody sings from the same hymn sheet at COP. And, and you would have noticed that in Glasgow, you'd notice it in Sharm El Sheikh, and then in Dubai again. Um, Prime Minister Motley is very much on the same tune with President Ali. So from a macro level, I think we've gotten a lot better, uh, sort of realizing finally that, you know, if we don't do this together, as Riyadh was quite rightly saying, uh, if we don't come together as not just Caribbean islands, but as an alliance of small island states, including our friends in the Pacific um, and some Latin American countries as well, um, you know, we're pretty much doomed if we don't do it together. From a micro standpoint, um, a lot of education needs to take place um, to bring everybody together to, to you know, to, to understand that we're all fighting against the same challenge. Uh, we're all fighting against the same demon here. And I think that is where a lot of our work needs to be done. And I wanna point back to our story I did with Ruana just before SIDS4. And in that story, she was calling for particularly financing for civil society. If the financing isn't trickling down to civil society, which in essence is doing much of the work when it comes to climate change, particularly in our country, I guess, um, then we have a problem. Because the people who need it the most aren't getting it. And I think that is where, from, my, from where I sit, that I think is where we really need to, I, I think it's a little bit, I, I like your question, I think it's a little bit, uh, isolated, uh, and I think if we could 
all become if they, we had more awareness drives like the particularly one the EMA is working on right now and will be launched next year if we had more of those things I think we would get that glue that is so critically needed to get everybody onto the same you know wavelength yes I think the first part of this session we focus a lot on the actions of governments and countries but thank you for bringing in the role of civil society you know, civil society continues to play a very pivotal role in climate action and also to some extent holding our leaders accountable. And you've brought out the um, important point of education. I think from today's discussion, education, finance, but also, you know, increased ambition. These stand out as important points for us to think about going forward, going into COP29 as we remain hopeful <laughs> um, that we can in fact, you know, make a dent or at least try to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. So at this point, I wanna open the floor for the audience to get um, involved. Any questions? Let's see, we have a question. It isn't a question. Good afternoon, all. And I really enjoyed Riyadh. Of course, Mr. Bishu. But I also loved Sasha because of the, you know, the topics. What interested me, Riyadh, is your educational program. I'm also seeing persons like me in the 70s, we enjoy learning so that when we stand up and the water running down, our, you know, it's not a second menopause. It's something to do with climate change. Hi, again, still Shanda. Um, I guess this might be the most relevant to Ryan. You kind of touched on it. Like you see it happen with these conferences, they go make these big declarations, then nothing happens. And then they do nothing and all these talk and it's all press media and all this hype. So going into Baku, we know Azerbaijan is trying to boost their tourism. So how is this COP going to stay grounded in reality? How are countries and parties going to get there and not be like, oh my God, all these things are happening in Azerbaijan, all these other things, like focus on what's going on. I know they negotiate leading up to it, going up to it, but once they get there, somehow it's just like the hype, you can't deny it. So how do, how do cops stay grounded in reality when you get there is my question. Thanks. I think Dubai was a good uh, playground for that one ahead of Baku because I think um, Dubai, and I get your question, but uh, because so many people wanted to go to Dubai, uh, not purely because of COP, because it was Dubai, you know, it was this amazing city and, you know, uh, everybody, it's very famous and, you know, everything that is associated with Dubai. Um, maybe, you know, Ruana and I were part of a conversation many months ago at Alliance of Rural Communities, uh, where we were discussing something similar to this, um, about, uh, yeah, and well, you were there too, yeah, um, and, it, it, you know, and I was making the point, um, that sometimes it feels like cops have become, you know, uh, like to use an, a reference, the World Cup, you know, it's, this is a very highly commercialized, you know, it's what every, where everybody wants to be and, you know, it's where everybody wants to go and it's the World Cup of climate change, if you want to call it that. But Ruana made some very good points that day and, and she reinforced it earlier to Sachin's question, which is a common question, which is a frustrating question to many people. And, and she's right. Um, at the end of the day, um, COP is not perfect, but it's the best process that we have. Uh, there is no other, if somebody else has a better process, you know, right to the UNFCCC, I'm sure they'll be able to, happy to hear from you. But right now, COP is the best process that we have. And contrary to all of the negative news that you see about climate change, and there is, and it is all true, 
there are a lot of good things happening because of these meetings, because of what happened in Bonn, because of what happened in Dubai, because of what happened in Paris, because of what happened 29 years, 28 years ago at the first call. There are a lot of good things happening, and I think that we should not always. There was a really good article in The Economist the other day where the, the, the writer, I can't forget, uh, I can't remember her name right now, but she took a completely different spin. Um, instead of writing about the doom and gloom of climate change, she actually wrote on some of the major milestones that the world actually reached because of COPs. I thought it was different from everything else that we wrote. So yeah, I think once we get there, Shandell, I think the people that matter, uh, like the negotiators and uh, the politicians, and to a greater extent, the media, I think they're all going to be focused, or at least I've seen in my experience at COPs that they, they get down to business and the beach could be after. Thanks for that, Ryan. And to Shandal's question, um, everybody wanted to go to Dubai. Nobody wants to go to Baku. Apples and oranges, right? But uh, to the, the core of this really goes to this notion of participation and what do we mean when we say, you know, we need to make these spaces more democratic and more representative and we need to have more participation. And no country has gotten it right as yet. So the Dubai model was a all comers type of model. Um, it was glitz and glam and flash in the in the you know in the culture that that they have there. And it was the largest COP ever, over 100,000 participants, right? Before that, the largest COP we'd ever had was in Paris, and there were 30,000 participants. And that was the largest, and that was in 2015, and that was an extraordinarily important COP. So I've been around long enough to know a time where I couldn't talk about COP in an audience like this. People would be like, what are you talking about? Nobody cares. So we've come a very long way, and it's not all a bad thing. It's not all a bad thing that we now have this as the World Cup of climate change, because at least people want to know they're interested and they care. Um, so, you know, I think we have, to, it, we have to take the good with the bad. I'm not sure what approach uh, the Azeris will take, but we know that the venue is a lot smaller. We know that they cannot accommodate in terms of just the number of rooms that are available in and around. They cannot accommodate the type of crowd that was present in Dubai. So I don't think we will see another COP like that. Um, but we wait to see what will happen. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian. And I have two questions. First is, is there a country strategy for education? Now, I'm thinking of not just secondary school students or university students, but other stakeholders. For example, at the last meeting here, um, I saw someone from the Scouts, right? So even thinking about different organizations and what might that strategy look like, that's one. And number two, are there efforts to think through how we might, as small island developing states, thrive in spite of what seems to be a foregone conclusion with temperature rises? Rana. <laughs> Well, we don't have government representatives here. Poor Riyadh is probably the closest thing uh, working with a state organization. Um, I, I don't think there is that comprehensive strategy in place, Christian. Uh, certainly from the climate analytics Caribbean point of view, <clears throat> our mission has really been to try to reach as many people as possible uh, with this type of information. Um, at the end of the day, we are still operating in a very capacity constrained environment. Uh, even if you look at, you know, the multilateral environments agreement um, division in the Ministry of Planning, which is which is the division that is dealing with all multilateral environmental agreements, not just in climate change, uh, they are severely understaffed. 
right? And they are <clears throat> attending these conferences as well as making the policies, as well as trying to implement the policies, as well as fundraising, as well as, as well as, as well as, as well as. So we are not in a position right now, I think, to have the kind of comprehensive climate education that we need to have, and which is also set out under the original convention in Article 6, under the Paris Agreement in Article 12. The work that Riyadh is doing on, in the ACE program is a part of that. So at the multilateral level, there is that recognition of the importance of capacity building and education on climate change. But we come back to the fundamental question, where is the money? And there is no money for it being available internationally. And back, back, back to what Ryan has said, um, for the most part, from a small island developing state perspective, even when we talk about finance, even where we have some access to finance and it's very small amounts compared to the needs, that access isn't trickling down to civil society necessarily. And if it is, it's again, very small amounts. So you have to do project here, project there, project there. You have to try to have a global vision in your head, which me and my entire team try to have at all times, a global vision in your head of, okay, this, this is the, the macro vision. And we have this small part here, this small part here, this small part here, this small part here, and this is how we'll bring it together. So it doesn't exist yet, but I hope it will come in terms of um, resilience building and resilience planning. I know that there's a lot of work underway um, uh, to design a national adaptation policy. There's a lot of individual projects happening right now on adaptation, on flooding specifically, even as climate analytics, we're involved in some work uh, on flooding, uh, looking at doing mapping in particular flood basins within Trinidad and Tobago. Um, for the use of a tool that could help us to plan better for those types of events. But again, this comes back to that the implementation of that global goal and adaptation framework that Sasha was speaking to, the indicators that are put in place, and then the financing that is made available to help countries with adaptation and resilience building. And, and that's why this finance year and this finance COP is so important and what Ambassador Felson spoke about in terms of a SIDS specific lens on that climate finance goal is so important because SIDS are speaking about the need for having the money available for adaptation, for resilience, for loss and damage in particular because of what we know is already happening and what is coming. Even if we stay within a one and a half degree trajectory, we will suffer more loss and damage. That is a fact. Uh, I just wanted to add real quick, just on your last point with um, us thriving in spite of the challenges. I, I feel sometimes um, some Caribbean people uh, think that um, we throw our hands up in the air and you know, we're the victims of climate change and we're not doing anything. I think we have some of the most resilient people in the world. In fact, I would jump up myself and I would say that in some parts, I just think we are such a beacon of hope um, for how people are gonna have to live in the future. I think we are, the, I think we have brilliant people, just forget the practical side. There's a really good documentary that Climate Analytics Caribbean did that really um, showcases to an extent, the resiliency of, of the Caribbean, but also on the human capital side. We have, and I'm not just calling Ruana because Ruana is on stage, but we have people like Ruana Haynes, we have people like Kishan Kumarsi, we have Mr. Seely, God rest his soul from Barbados, who's now passed on. The human beings that we have on the world stage representing us are second to none. And, and uh, so we are thriving. What we need is we need access to resources and we need the access to climate finance to push that even further along and further ahead. So, uh, you know, I just I just wanted to say that because I feel like some Caribbean people feel like when Rana goes to COP and Kishan goes Yeah, we're, it's it's quite the opposite. We have really good people 
uh, just as the United States and China and India have really strong people leading their agenda, we have really good people leading our agenda. And I, I just wanted to always hit bricks when people just not to make people feel that we're the victims here. We actually do a pretty damn good job in the Caribbean. Hello, everybody. Good night. Um, firstly, I just want to say congratulations on the launch of that program next year. That's amazing. That's a really good initiative. Um, my colleague and I were actually discussing that it reminds us of the environmental ambassador program. So great. Um, what is the EMA and potentially, I guess, the media doing to provoke change um, at the Ministry of Education to basically ensure that this curriculum is implemented in our schools and also, a whole, as a whole society, they approach education on climate change. Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, so it is a reinvention of that Youth Ambassadors program, but it was discontinued um, roughly 10 years ago. And the reinvention was just based off of the fact that climate change is the big ticket item and it really needs to, to reach everybody. Um, we have an entire public education unit that is dedicated to, well, very limited in capacity. I could count the amount of members on one hand, um, but very dedicated to educating all stakeholders across Trinidad and Tobago. And we do that through um, outreach, lectures, presentations, almost every other day. Um, but we also have programs that aim to educate them as well. So um, for example, through the Ministry of Education, we did a uh, uh, anti well, Lisa comprehension activity. So during COVID time, um, they were looking for different ways to educate the kids because, of course, it's, they were acclimatized into this whole online system. And they um, reached out to the EMA and we actually developed a comprehension activity, which we launched this year. So that's just one example. Um, they also reached out to us to revamp the Form 3 Integrated Science um, curriculum and to really include climate change. So it's something that I was working on as well. Um, so that, those are just two ways that we work with the Ministry of Education. Um, we also have an Enviro Clubs program. So through that program, we invite primary schools and secondary schools to create an Enviro Club. So we go to the schools, we have an a introductory session, we give them advice on how to set it up, and six, month, six months down the line, we go back, check in with them, and you know, once they really get things started, we um, bring them on to the Enviro Club program. And every term, we actually share activities with them. And we don't, EMA alone doesn't do that. We reach out to other organizations to find ways um, to engage the students. So um, we're actually partnering with an a, a NGO right now. Um, and we did a, a road show where we were going to different schools and actually teaching them about um, the marine environment, the Maritime Ocean Collective. It's a species um, project. Yeah, so that's something that we are doing as well. And, I mean, we're trying our best because the, again, um, very limited capacity. Um, but yeah, we're very, very dedicated to, to really educating everyone, um, both in Trinidad and Tobago, not just the youths, but you know, we go to organizations, um, different levels, um, oil and gas companies too, to educate them about the environment. So the education is happening. Um, it just needs to be more consistent and you know, so that we could get that, that change and get that, that education going. So I think we have time for one, two more questions. So Sasha. Hello. Oh, sorry. So this is not a question. I, I would say this would be a comment just based on the questions here on the importance of education and behavioral change in, um, in Trinidad and Tobago, especially on climate action and not just only for youth, but it has to be a, it's a whole of society behavioral change approach that we need um, from you know, children all the way up to retirees and elderly people, because they need to be aware of what is happening in terms of climate change. And I think we have, so my background is in engineering, so I'm very focused on solutions, <laughs> right? And we have an opportunity in 2025 where countries have to submit their updated NDCs, NDC 3.0, and this is where we could actually say, this is what we want for, this is what our climate actions for Trinidad and Tobago could be. And it has to be participatory, it has to be inclusive, 
and it has to outline these are our key um, actions, these are our key outcomes, and this is how we want to do it. And climate education and having this sort of strategy can be part of it because that will inform everything else if it is on mitigation, if it is on just transition, on loss and damage. So that can be part of it. So what I would say is that you all here have to be part of that, that discussion on how we go about you know, um, developing our more ambitious, updated NDCs in 2025. And I think that is one way to do it. You all, instead of us saying, what, what can we do when we cannot be involved, that is actually one avenue that everybody could, could be part of, right? So I'm just letting you all know that. <laughs> and, um, and then also, I just also wanted to let you all know that Trinidad and Tobago submitted its national adaptation plan at the SBs in June. It is available on the UNF C website. Definitely take a look at it. Definitely ensure that, you know, um, government and stakeholders are held accountable for the implementation of the national adaptation plan. I think it's quite important for everybody to read it and to be aware of it and to know what's going on. It. It's been I would say a labor of love for people involved in, in developing the plan. It's quite comprehensive. And I do, you know, I think what the whole point of that national adaptation plan is, it's not just supposed to be a document. It has to be implemented and it has to be useful for all. So just those two points. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha, for admonishing us to be become more informed and involved in climate action. Okay. Good evening. My name is Alicia. Um, I have one just brief question. You mentioned lastly, and I'm hearing it throughout the um, entire seminar. Um, well, my mind initially went to how do we provide that information for you? Is there an outreach program that you guys have or a volunteer um, program that we can come and offer some services? Even state agencies would have some level of information, support, or persons who you can't procure, but we could offer some kind of services. Um, is there any program? One, is there any program that exists where we could come and volunteer services? And two, exactly how do we help to provide that information to you guys? Thanks for the question. Um, well, when Sasha was talking about providing the information, I think she was talking about the government when they are doing their stakeholder consultation process. Um, they normally send out information that they are having a consultation on a particular policy. Uh, we hope that in the context of preparing the new nationally determined contribution that they will also undertake a stakeholder process, which I think we can probably work with them to help to spread the word that it's happening to make sure that everyone who needs to be at the table and consulted in is consulted on it. In terms of climate analytics, we don't have a volunteer program at this time. I am very much a stickler for if people are working with us, we have to pay them. I, I do not believe in, in, the, in the European volunteer model, sorry. But um, there are, we do have a number of events where we try to get people involved in the conversation and we will have a number upcoming, um, including in relation to energy and renewable energy in particular, that might be quite interesting. So please do follow our socials, uh, LinkedIn, Net, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, X formerly known as Twitter, uh, to stay updated on what's happening. And um, there will be opportunities um, for you to engage with us directly on you know, several different projects that we have in the pipeline. So do look forward to that. Um, but we do also have vacancies from time to time. So you could also watch that space if you want to work with us. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thanks, Rana. So if there are no burning questions, I will now invite Rana to help us wrap the session with some closing refle reflections. Right, I promise I will be hopeful this time. 
No, honestly, I, I struggled a little bit um, with what I was going to say in the opening because, um, you know, even for somebody who has been involved in a diplomatic process for as long as I have, uh, I, I do have trouble not saying how I really feel. And so what you all got in the opening is how I really feel. Uh, with that said, I think we've heard a lot this evening that gives us a reason for hope. Um, Rayad, I hear from youth a lot this frustration around feeling, you know, as if they've been tokenized. And um, I, I understand the frustration completely. Um, but for me, uh, somebody who is a little older and a little more jaded, um, it's really important to have youth involved. Um, it's really, really important because the youth always give me as an individual hope. Uh, the hope that I need to continue doing what we do. And um, it's, it's a role that I think cannot be overlooked. Um, from the perspective of the youth, I mean, you have no choice, this is your future. And you want to believe that you will be able to have a viable future right and to enjoy the things that those who came before also enjoyed so you have to be hopeful and so for the rest of us who have been around a little longer it's important to be able to share in that hope and so let me leave you guys with a few hopeful hopeful factoids uh to go forward with um so when we started the discussion i'd mentioned that the Paris Agreement had bent the emissions curve significantly. One of the major milestones that we need to hit in order to keep that one and a half degrees limit um, alive and within reach is to peak global emissions before 2025. Uh, Climate Analytics, the broader global organization, uh, we're putting together some studies now that show that it is very likely that we will peak by 2025. Uh, the issue will be maintaining that and not going back up again afterwards. But it, and well, the issue will be making sure that we continue to have a steep decline after the peak. But it is likely that we will peak and that will be extremely good news um, once it can be confirmed. Uh, we are also in the process of looking forward to new NDCs. Um, NDC 3.0 is what they're calling it, these nationally determined contributions that set out, you know, what countries will do in order to address climate change, their mitigation adaptation actions. And it is very likely that some of the largest emitters will come forward with extremely ambitious NDCs this year. We look forward to good NDCs from the likes of Brazil, which would be important, even from the likes of China, which would be extremely important. And once we have these ambitious NDCs, they will send a really clear signal that climate action and the need for ambitious action is in fact irreversible. It will send a signal for the momentum that we will need for the rest of this critical decade. When we look at the facts and figures around renewable energy and we break down that global pledge to triple renewable energy, Climate Analytics has done a study looking at what needs to happen in each region, uh, each of the five UN regions around that goal. And for many regions, um, this goal, those sub goals will be met. For some of them, they are close to being met. It is likely that they will meet it once the relevant financing is in place. So there are glimmers of hope on the, on the horizon. There are still questions about whether we will get there fast enough, because at this point, we need to be looking at a very rapid transformation and not an incremental one but there's always reason for hope, especially with the youth pushing us um, to do what needs to be done. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you all so very much for coming out. We do have light 
refreshments and drinks. Please stay and socialize. Thank you.